Welcome to the final episode of the Ben Shapiro Election Special. It's been an honor and a privilege to be here with you the last three Sundays, and we are truly grateful for your viewership. We've got a huge show lined up for you tonight. A great panel, a debate with Richard Fowler, and a closer look at the left's absolute panic over Kanye West's White House visit. But we begin tonight with something we call the Big Takedown, the Democratic Party's embrace of the mob. Last week, President Trump roiled Democrats when he rightly pointed out that the Democratic Party has endorsed the politics of the mob. Democrats have become totally unhinged. They've gone, they've gone crazy. You don't hand matches to an arsonist, and you don't give power to an angry left-wing mob. President Trump was right, of course. The Democrats have embraced the politics of the mob. We've seen leftist mobs try to break through the doors of the Supreme Court. Good luck with that. Those doors weigh 13 tons. We've also seen protesters accosting senators and screaming at them. Why are you brave enough to talk to us and exchange with us? Don't you wave your hand at me. Such pleasant folks. We've seen mobs try to drive Republican senators out of restaurants. We believe in the Maybe it was way hotter than you do. We believe in the And over the past few months, we've actually seen Democrats openly encourage such tactics. These members of his cabinet who remain and try to defend him, they're not going to be able to go to a restaurant. They're not going to be able to stop at a gas station. They're not going to be able to shop at a department store. The people are going to turn on them. They're going to protest. They're going to uh, absolutely harass them until they decide that they're going to tell the president, no, I can't hang with you. This week alone, we saw endorsement of such tactics from Senator Maisie Hirono of Hawaii who said that hounding public officials was fine because of white supremacy or something. When you look at white supremacists and, and all that, this is what's coming forth in our country. There's a tremendous divisiveness in our country, but uh, uh, this is the kind of uh, activism that occurs and people make their own decisions. Former Attorney General Eric Holder emerged from the woodwork to explain that the new politics of the Democratic Party is to actually kick Republicans when they go low. But Michelle Wood says that, you know, when they go low, we go high. No. No. When they go low, we kick them. And, of course, we saw Hillary Clinton, who, thank God, is still not president, state that civility with Republicans is completely out of the question. You cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for, what you care about. That's why I believe, if we are fortunate enough to win back the House and or the Senate. That's when civility can start again. Now, many in the media, particularly over at CNN, made excuses for both this incendiary rhetoric and for the mob itself. In a peculiar form of gaslighting, Brooke Baldwin of CNN suggested that mobs in Washington, D.C. weren't really mobs. The only true mobs are Republican mobs. A mob is what we saw in Charlottesville, Virginia, two August ago. No, a mob is both. not what we saw chasing. I'm what not about, saying what, what they the did people, was right. What about the people who were at the Supreme Court banging on the walls? What do you call that? Civil protest? Or is that a mob? So much journalism from CNN. Don Lemon on CNN, he said the same thing. He said that people who harass people at restaurants aren't mobs. Those are just, you know, angry people. Is it mob behavior? No, it's not my behavior. Thank you. It's people who are no, upset and they're angry not. with the way the, the way the country is going. And, of course, Jim Acosta of CNN. And, folks, find you someone who loves you, like Jim Acosta loves Jim Acosta. Tried to blame President Trump for the Democrats' mob strategy. Have you been to a Trump rally? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, you do hear rhetoric at, at those rallies that would uh, conjure up images of a mob. Perhaps the president uh, knows what mob rule and, and mob tactics look like because he encourages them himself. The media's attempts to cover for Democratic mobs are nothing new, and neither are Democratic embraces of the mob. The truth is that this strategy, emboldening political mobs in order to strengthen political power, has been a mainstay among Democrats for generations. In the 1960s, Democrats across the country engaged in what author Fred Siegel calls riot ideology, the belief that riots were a reflection of deep underlying social ills 
that could only be cured by more government. Demagogues like Marion Barry, who would later become mayor of Washington, D.C., fully embraced this logic. He said of the Black Panthers, quote, I know for a fact that white people get scared of the Panthers, and they might look at somebody a little more moderate and say, well, let's give them a little money. New York City Mayor John Lindsay said that mass unrest could be the spur to more leftist policies, explaining, quote, our experience is that some good can come of confrontation politics. The left fully embraced the Occupy Wall Street movement, despite its routine violation of law. That movement supposedly represented the best American politics had to offer. Jay Carney, Obama's White House press secretary, said of Occupy that, quote, one man's mob is another man's democracy. President Obama himself expressed sympathy for rioters in cities ranging from Baltimore to Ferguson. On the other hand, those who are only interested in focusing on the violence and just want the problem to go away uh, need to recognize that we do have work to do here. And we shouldn't try to paper it over. Um, whenever we do that, uh, the anger may momentarily subside, but over time, uh, it builds up, uh, and uh, America uh, isn't everything that it could be. In fact, President Obama wasn't afraid to use the mob as a catalyst for his policy preferences. In 2009, he infamously told bank CEOs that they'd better cave to his policy demands because, quote, my administration is the only thing between you and the pitchforks. And President Obama was not afraid to use his own charged language to channel anger for political purposes. You remember this one? If they bring a knife to the fight, we bring a gun? Or do you remember when President Obama told people to, quote, argue with their neighbors, get in their face? Obama's White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Jim Messina, he told Democrats to, quote, punch back twice as hard. And, of course, much of the left has come out to support Antifa. Like, for example, CNN's objective reporter, Chris Cuomo. But fighting hate is right. And in a clash between hate and those who oppose it, those who oppose it are on the side of right. People who show up to fight against bigots are not to be judged the same as the bigots, even if they do resort to the same kinds of petty violence. In fact, a favorite tactic of the modern left is to allow mob violence on college campuses, then claim that conservative speakers like me can't come to campus thanks to the threat of mob violence. That's what happened when I tried to speak at DePaul University in Chicago last year, where security threatened to arrest me for showing up after students suggested that things might get violent. Just to be, just to be clear, if I attempt to enter that hall right there and sit down just to listen to somebody speak, or if I attempt to ask a question or engage in free speech, you will have me arrested. At this point, yes, sir. Okay. It's quite odd how the supposedly unbiased media seems so unwilling to call out democratic mob politics but so eager to label conservatives violent. Democrats certainly had no problem panicking over President Trump's violent rhetoric in 2016. And Democrats have even been willing to slander nonviolent conservatives. They routinely called Tea Partiers members of a mob or even terrorists. Here's Jimmy Hoffa Jr. introducing President Obama at an event in 2011 and going after the Tea Party. Let's take these son of a out and give America back to America where we belong. Thank you very much. When I spoke at Berkeley, hundreds of protesters, some of whom got violent and were arrested, chanted that my speech was itself a form of violence. So that's the leftist logic. Everything conservatives do is violent and aggressive, but nothing Democrats do is. And herein lies the point. For Democrats, every available avenue of resistance against Republicans is justified. Riots aren't riots. They're uprisings. Mobs aren't mobs. Those are just angry people. According to the media and the political left, but I repeat myself, Republicans are evil, so even their speech is violence. Democrats are good, so even their violence is speech. The democratic embrace of mob politics is ugly, but it may be just the reminder Americans need that handing power to a group of people who cheer on the mob while attacking individual rights would be a terrible, terrible mistake. That's tonight's Big Takedown. Coming up, we're going to take a deeper look at the left's utter panic over Kanye West's White House visit. Thanks for watching the Ben Shapiro election special. Welcome back to the final episode of the Ben Shapiro election special. Tonight, we dig into the left's despicable response to Kanye West's visit to the White House. Now, 
I'm no Kanye West fan. Like, really. I've never been a fan of rap, and when Kanye first came out for President Trump, I tweeted, quote, live by the Kanye, die by the Kanye. I also have a general rule when it comes to celebrities talking about politics. I don't care. Still, Kanye West has just as much legitimacy as any other celebrity in the political space. And the same people in the media who have held up Alyssa Milano as an authority on Supreme Court nominations are now savaging Kanye for having the temerity to wear a MAGA hat. Here's what Kanye had to say. There was something about when I put this hat on, it made me feel like Superman. You made a Superman. That was, that's my favorite superhero. And you made a Superman cape for me also as a guy that looks up to you, looks up to rapper, and looks up to American industry guys. It's just delicious. But the media reacted with utter shock and horror. Here, for example, is the reaction of MSNBC's Ali Velshi and Stephanie Rule to Kanye's Oval Office appearance. Wow. Okay, I'm doing this for everybody who's watching us who turned their volume down. You can put it back up again. That but if you think bonkers. you're going to get uh, uh, a thoughtful play-by-play -play and political analysis, you're not. Because that was an assault on our White House. Jim Acosta of CNN was utterly appalled that Kanye cursed in the Oval Office, tweeting, quote, Kanye just said, M mother bleeper, in the Oval Office, per White House pool. Members of the media are so angry about Kanye in the White House, they might also be angry if, say, Snoop Dogg went to the White House and smoked pot there. Oh, wait, he says he did when Barack Obama was president. When you went, was it a better experience, or were you like, oh, man, I, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have talked it up? No, it was, it was an awesome experience. It's one for the ages, and I can't wait for him to, you know, come out of the office so we can talk about what really, really, really went down. Or maybe the media might be upset if Jay-Z and Beyonce took over the Situation Room. Oh, wait, they did, when Barack Obama was president. Or maybe they'd be enraged if common. A rapper whose lyrics have glorified terrorist Asada Shakur went to the White House. Oh, wait, he did, when Barack Obama was president. Now, I'm pretty consistent on this. I don't like celebrity politics, no matter which side it comes from. But here's the truth. Folks in the media are only angry at Kanye. They are angry beyond belief that West has bucked the Hollywood status quo. That status quo says that people in Hollywood are not allowed to be conservative, let alone Republican, let alone Trump supporters. If you voted for Trump in Hollywood, you are an outcast. You're seen as an emissary of evil. And if you are a black celebrity who backs Trump, that's even worse. Then you're basically Satan. Kanye checks the boxes on both counts. He's one of the biggest celebrities on planet Earth, and he's a black man. That means he's a traitor to both his race and to his industry, according to the media. How else can we explain the level of absolute vicious outrage from the left over Kanye's willingness to reach out to Trump, who, by the way, has already reached back out to Kanye by pardoning Alice Marie Johnson, and now wants to reach out even more with criminal justice reform. Just listen to former Democratic National Committee chairwoman Donna Brazil, who tweeted that Kanye had set black Americans back 155 years, all the way back to 1863, when slavery was still in force. Yes, a black man visiting the White House to express his own perspective somehow set blacks all the way back to slavery. What a disgusting, nasty, vile comment, and it gets even worse. Here is objective CNN host Don Lemon invoking Kanye's dead mom in order to shame him. This was an embarrassment. Kanye's mother is rolling over in her grave. Just gross. Or check out this panel from CNN in which several contributors slam Kanye as mentally ill and ignorant. And Don Lemon laughed along. Kanye West is what happens when Negroes don't read. Um, and, and we have this now, and now Donald Trump is going to use it and pervert it, and he's going to have somebody who can stand with him and take pictures. <laughs> that right there, that's called blatant racism. Kanye isn't legitimately black because of his viewpoint, apparently. He's obviously crazy, too. This is identity politics at its finest. Kanye can't think differently because Kanye is of a particular race. All of this fits into a broader view, held by many on the left, that America is now divided between white folks and minority folks, and that minority folks believe woke social justice warrior dogma. In fact, if they don't, they're race traitors. There's only one problem for the left. That is simply not true. 
A new study titled Hidden Tribes from Four Academics investigated how Americans feel about political correctness. And the study found that Americans hate political correctness, regardless of age, race, or income. Americans are not interested in the left's brand of groupthink. Fully 80% of Americans believe political correctness is a problem, including 82% of Asians, 87% of Hispanics, 88% of Native Americans, and three quarters of black Americans. In fact, the only group of people who still believe in political correctness are far left progressives. And hilariously, as the study suggests, those progressives are disproportionately white and rich. Leftists want to tell everybody else what to think, but Americans think for themselves. Kanye West says he freed his mind of what he calls self-victimization. He's urged people to think for themselves. He should certainly be applauded for that. Those who aren't applauding, the people who say Kanye West should be torn apart for acting like an individual rather than collapsing to the tyranny of intersectionality, they're just demonstrating how intolerant they are. And here's the problem for Democrats and their media allies. More and more Americans know it. Americans of all colors agree that the politically correct identity politics of the left, those politics are purely toxic. No wonder the left is so scared of Kanye and so scared of anyone who thinks outside the box. Coming up, Fox News contributor Richard Fowler stops by to battle it out over Kanye and the left's embrace of the mob. You're not going to want to miss it. Election special. Well, back to Kanye West and the left's mob tactics. Here to debate. Radio talk show host and Fox News contributor Richard Fowler. Richard, thanks so much for stopping by. Good to be here. Let's start with Kanye because Kanye is more fun. So, <laughs> what, is, what was your take on Kanye? And, and more importantly, how do you think? How do you respond to the media's response to Kanye? Because you saw some pretty over-the-top statements from folks like Don Lemon suggesting his mom would be embarrassed of him. Uh, you saw. So l listen, I, I I I I tried to before I ignored the media's comments and I watched it a couple times. I watched it a, numerous times and I tried to. I mean, it was at best stream of consciousness at worst, incoherent, uh, depending upon who watched it, what view you took. I took some pull quotes. My favorite of the pull quotes was this one. Um, we don't have reparations, but we have the 13th Amendment, quote Kanye West. And it was an interesting quote for me because I, I think where it is, and it's a very interesting turn of events for, um, for, for conservatives, because they are now in the seat where they're defending Kanye West. And when you think about it, his policies are not really aligned with where the president is, because I don't think the president or Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell, or even you for that matter, are rushing out to pass a reparations bill to give African Americans 40 acres and a mule. Uh, and I don't think that we, there's even a, a commitment to change the 13th Amendment so we can end prisons or imprisoning people. People. So where Kanye is is very different from where the president of the Republican Party is, but now conservatives are defending Kanye. Well, I think most, most of what we're defending Kanye on, and I, I've always said, live by the Kanye, <laughs> die by the Kanye. But what, what, I've said, but what I've said about Kanye is that what I think is important is that he's at least expressing that he wants to think as an individual and he doesn't feel like being boxed in by identity politics. And this is why I'm asking the media question, because what you do see from a bunch of members of the media over the last several days has been this attempt to basically say that Kanye is some sort of race traitor, that Kanye has done something deeply wrong to betray people. Do you believe that? Or? No, but listen, Kanye's entitled to his opinions. I just believe that you have to be very responsible when you make those opinions, right? Because you do have an audience, and it's your job to be very educated about the opinions that you do make. I tend to agree, but he's a celebrity, right? Is this a new rule for Kanye, or does it also no, no, hold I think, that, I think that, rule, that rule applies to every celebrity. So when like, you walk into the, Milano, maybe? Yeah, when you walk into the Oval Office and you say that you believe that people who are innocent uh, or people who are convicted of wrongfully or people who are convicted of drug crime should be set free, that's one thing. But then to go in there and say, I believe you should release Larry Hoover, one of the most notorious gangsters in America who's in the supermax next to the Unabomber, that's indeed problematic, and so education is important. I'm not going to sit here and say, well, race, race aside, I have a problem with releasing Larry Hoover back into well, the streets I mean, of America. So do I, but I think that the, the real question here is the double standard when it comes to celebrity from, from the left. But let's talk about the mob politics point, because that's the other narrative this week, was the, the President Trump pushing the idea that the Democrats have embraced mob politics. Is that overstating the case, or do you think that on... A lot of sides these days, the, the rhetoric is overheated. Well, listen, I think we live in a tribalist society. I think if you were to take this, if you were to rewind the tapes, right, what, what you, what Republicans are saying, what conservatives are saying, Democrats are saying in 2010 during the health care debate, or even during the government shutdown, when we saw folks rip down the, the, the metal barricades in front of the World War II memorial, 
it, we are we are currently in a tribalist society where you have both sides yelling at each other. And would you talk in 24 days from now? Do you really think there's an equation between like the Tea Party and what we just saw outside the Supreme Court or in the Senate building? I think what you see is you see both you see tribalism on both sides. You see people saying this is what we want. We're going to yell until we get it. But is one but, side kind of? But wait, wait a minute. Let, let me finish my point. The point I'm trying to make here is that in this tribalism, neither what the American people are truly asking. They're not asking for people to be relatable. They're asking for representation. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, while we're both yelling at each other. 20 veterans committed suicide today. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, both in rural and urban communities, people don't have access to health care, and they want answers well, to those problems, and that's what this election's well, about. There we can agree, and I think that we can all agree that civility would probably be a better solution Absolutely. than what we've been seeing. Well, Richard, thanks so much for <laughs> stopping by. Coming up, our rundown panel joins us, and we'll churn through this week's hottest issues. Welcome to the rundown panel. We're going to run through a series of topics in a way you haven't heard. Faster, more content, Everybody's got about 30 seconds to give their take. No topic takes longer than 90 seconds, and I will ding you if we hit the time limit or if you just get boring, because clocks don't care about your feelings. Joining me today, Real Clear Politics Senior Elections Analyst Sean Trend, writer at The Daily Wire Amanda Prestigiacomo, and The Daily Wire Senior Editor Emily Zanotti. All right, let's play. So let's begin today with our assessment of the election, since it's now about three weeks away. Sean, where do you think this is going? Well, one of the things that happened from the Kavanaugh hearing is it basically made everybody angry. Um, we've seen Republican enthusiasm spike and Democratic enthusiasm spike. The problem that the Democrats have from this is that it means that uh, their, their odds in the Senate have gone down significantly. They need to win in some very red states to take the Senate, and uh, it's, it's uh, been a problem for them. The House is a different story, though. Uh, in the House, the Democrats don't have to go quite as deeply into red territory. What this has probably done in the House is put the cap on their gains, so the probability of a 40 or 50 seat pickup is much smaller. Mm -hmm. It's now a fight over who's going to get a narrow majority. The Democrats probably have an edge, but not an overwhelming one. Amanda, do you feel an additional surge of enthusiasm among Republicans? I know that I do when I'm talking to Republicans oh, these days. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, the Democrats were already like galvanized, you know, they were all just anti-Trump, but now, I mean, Republicans are so enthused by this Kavanaugh smear. I mean, it was pretty grotesque, it was pretty disgusting, so we have a lot of moms. Um, actually, there was polling, there was good analysis by uh, Ryan Gerdeski um, about, uh, it was the Santa College and, and New York Times was looking at white working class millennials were actually tipping the scales towards Republicans in the House. So I don't, I don't not only think that we're going to pick up a few seats in the Senate, I think we're going to keep the House too, which is a an ambitious. Um, Emily, I've been, I've been informed reliably that women are very upset and are going to vote we in are. large numbers we're very against upset. Republicans. <laughs> From what I understand, we're voting in large numbers, but it looks like we're voting in large numbers for Republicans. Quite honestly, it looks like Repub or Democrats did in two weeks what Republicans have been trying to do in 10 years, <laughs> which is unite everybody behind a single issue. And they did that with the Kavanaugh hearing. Okay, we have to talk about Kanye. So next time, we, we have to talk about Kanye because Kanye was a thing. I don't know anything about Kanye. <laughs> I, I used to call him Yee instead of Ye because I really didn't know the difference, oh, which I guess makes easy. me ignorant. <laughs> easy. Okay, okay, so Amanda. <laughs> Was this a good move by President Trump to bring Kanye into the Oval Office? 100%. I mean, I want to inject that meaning into my veins. I mean, it was, it was <laughs> incredible. I mean, he just exposed so much of the left. I mean, we literally saw a CNN panel call him a house N-word. Or, or uh, I mean, it was just outrageous. They're calling him a, a traitor to his race. You just, you see the group think of the left, and you see that you cannot, you know, any, if you don't tell that line, you're going to be called mentally ill, for instance, which is insane. Yeah. I don't remember the media calling um, Kanye West when he said George W. Bush doesn't care about black people. I don't remember them calling him um, you know, a traitor to his race or mentally ill then. So yeah. this exposes the left so much. And Emily, I know that you also are a Kanye West fan, so Kanye your words West here are valuable. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I think Kanye West was the right move for President Trump. Honestly, I think we had eight years where Obama brought in every Hollywood celebrity under the sun. They spoke to people. They spoke to people who don't particularly get involved in politics. And Kanye said it himself. It wasn't that he was on the outside. It was on the, that he was on the outside of what everyone else was thinking. And hey, if Kanye can get it done, then well, more power to him. Well, this is the question. So, Sean, neither you nor I know anything about Kanye West, <laughs> is, is my impression. But with that said, uh, there's been a lot of talk about Republicans making significant gains in the black community. Do you see any of that reflected in the polling? Not not significant gains, but uh, we, you know, if you look at younger African Americans, they're not as uh, as clearly uh, democratic as the older generation. I mean, personally, I just look at the Kanye thing, and I think it's proof we proof we live on the weirdest possible timeline. <laughs> the best. Um, the best. The best. <laughs> um, but 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 you know, look, if the Republicans are going to do outreach, if they're going to make improvements in the African American community, this is the type of thing that they need. Uh, they need some representation. Okay, so next topic. 
the Democrats have obviously been embracing increasingly mob-like language from Maxine Waters to Hillary Clinton saying civility is over. Emily, is their mob language going too far? Or is, this, is this the new politics? Should we just get used to this? I think this is just the new politics. I mean, it's certainly going too far. I think they've taken what Trump did during the 2016 elections, and they've gone in an entirely different direction. You have Hillary Clinton acting like Emperor Palpatine, like, let the hate flow through, <laughs> right? Um, but really what's happening is I think Democrats have this symbiotic relationship with the media that typically flats back on conservatives. But in this case, they're believing their own hype. And they're coming back to themselves and saying, we need to double down on this particular strategy, which is essentially scratching at the doors of the Supreme Court like a bunch of outraged zoo animals. Sean, what are you seeing in terms of the reaction from the populace to this? Do you think that this is a line of attack that's going to work for Republicans? You know, I, I think it does energize the base in this close to an election. It's a, it's a good thing. Uh, I also agree that there, there's this kind of me too aspect of trying to, trying, that's the wrong term, but try, <laughs> trying, to, uh, trying to do what Trump did. And, and Trump was unique. I mean, his mm. stick kind of worked for him. I don't think it, it generalizes. Yeah, how about you, Amanda? Where, where yeah. are you on this? No, no, Trump is, you know, in his, his own element, in his own singular Nobody can can be Trump, and we see these Democrats trying to be Trump. I mean, Nan from Nancy Pelosi to Cory Booker to Hillary Clinton. I mean, the list goes on. Maxine Water, this this new this new beauty, um, Maisie Hirono. I mean, they're all they're all justifying all of this violence. I mean, we've seen a spate of these incidents. Um, John Nolte at Breitbart had 600 incidents against Trump supporters yeah. since the election. It's, 600. It, it's pretty amazing. Well, yeah. we will be right back with more from our awesome panel. Stay tuned. And we're back with Sean, Amanda, and Emily for our rundown panel. And we go through every topic. It takes about 90 seconds. So let's get to the next topic. There's a new study uh, that was out from four academics. The Atlantic did a big article about it, about political correctness, suggesting that it's not just white people who don't like political correctness. In fact, 80% of all Americans don't like political correctness, including three-quarters of black folks and 88% of Native Americans. Sean, is this an opening for Republicans, or is everybody just using a different definition of political correctness here? There's probably some degree that people are just using a different uh, definition of political correctness, but I think it's useful to distinguish. There's an element to political correctness that is just like, don't be a jerk, right? That, that I think there's broad agreement uh, on. It's when it becomes dogmatic uh, and shuts down conversation that I pe think people have this reaction of not liking it, and like you said, it... it cuts across the board. But Emily, you actually did this story, so what, right. what, what's your breakdown? I here? don't think that Republicans will be able to capitalize on this at all. And that's because the researchers admitted that nobody that they spoke to had an exact definition of political correctness. So they could all say, you know what, I'm really afraid about being a jerk to my fellow American, but I can't really say this is exactly what I should be avoiding. So it's going to be hard to create a unified message unless there's a unified definition of political correctness. I think there is a unified definition of woke social justice progressive. Right. That was the part of the study that was right. fascinating to me, was that every other group doesn't like political correctness. The woke social justice progressives do, and they are almost entirely white and rich. Yeah, right. Which sort of you gives have, a light to all of this. If you have a hate has no home here sign on your lawn, you are most likely rich, white, and highly educated. <laughs> so, Amanda, <laughs> how, what, do you think that that's something for Republicans to build on, or are they basically... Sure, sure. I mean, we've, I mean, this kind of thing goes hand in hand with identity politics, and we've seen, you know, this, this heightening of political correctness, and we've seen liberals leave the left in droves. So I think like, Republicans can capitalize on this because you can only for so long bash people for being racist and sexist and whatever before they start fighting back and they're, they're told not to talk. Next topic. So this one, this is the most undercovered story I thought of the week. There was a Google internal document that was leaked to Breitbart News this week, and it showed that the media giant actually wants to move toward a more European view of free speech. Do you think Americans should be scared of that, or is this just a move by social media that's sort of inevitable. What do you make of it? I mean, Amanda? this is terrifying. I mean, we can. I mean, this is the new public square. And if we're going to have these people, we're going to have the people who cried and wept openly when Donald Trump won the election. Tell us what is quote gender bigotry and what is acceptable speech. I mean, it's really scary stuff. I mean, it, it's it's on par with a government overreaching because they control so much. This is a very terrifying document. Sean, do you see government regulation coming in this area because of this sort of stuff? I think it's hard uh, to get something like that through Congress, uh, just because of how hard it is to move anything through Congress. But look, conservatives have been concerned about media bias for a very long time, and yet they've had very good years in 1994, and 2004, and 2010, 2014. So I don't think we should overstate the effect uh, that this bias has. Conservatives have been able to get their message through, and I'm sure that'll continue. Uh, Emily, you know, we're on social media a lot, yeah. obviously, in the business that we do. I think we've seen some of the blowback. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised by the, the Google document? I wasn't surprised. It took forever for them to compile this, but 
but I think this was the answer that they were going for all along. And especially when it comes to the European Union, they're looking at a situation in the EU where they're now going to be responsible for what people put on their platforms. And so Google wants to step back and say, you know, we're going to go more with the EU where it's dignity over conflict and where it's, you know, unified and quiet. And we're going to police things that are misogyny and gender bigotry. Well, yes. thank you all for stopping by. Coming up, our closing thought, 10 reasons you should go out and vote Republican on November 6th. Welcome back to the final episode of the Ben Shapiro election special. It's now time for our closing thought. 10 reasons you should go out and vote on November 6th and vote Republican. The 2018 election is just 22 days away. It's pretty close. Republicans have gained ground in the Senate over the last couple of weeks. In the House, however, Republicans still trail badly. A new CNN poll has Republicans down 13 points in the generic congressional ballot. And even the more optimistic Economist poll has them down six. All of this should motivate you to get out and vote. Because if Democrats win the House and the Senate in 2018, conservatives should be prepared for an all-out assault on their values and an assault on President Trump from a media that makes the last two years look like child's play. Here are 10 reasons you should get out and vote on November 6th and vote Republican. Number one, the courts, obviously. For generations, the left has stacked the courts with judicial activists determined to read their priorities into the law by twisting the Constitution beyond recognition. President Trump and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell have successfully remade the federal judiciary by appointing and confirming judges dedicated to the proposition that the Constitution must be read as it was written. If Democrats somehow win back the Senate, they will hold open every single judicial seat, hoping a Democrat takes the White House in 2020. Then they'll go right back to rigging the judicial branch, using it as a club with which to destroy constitutional rights and traditional values. Reason number two, the investigations. Get ready, gang. Democrats have already pledged investigations into every aspect of President Trump's life. They will subpoena every member of government they can get their hands on. And we know they don't really care about guilt or innocence. After all, they just tried to railroad a federal judge by claiming, without corroborating evidence, that he was an alleged gang rapist. In fact, Democrats have already pledged to launch another investigation into Justice Kavanaugh, hoping to undo the results of that confirmation vote. If you enjoyed the disgusting spectacle of Democrats trying to destroy due process of law, get ready for a lot more. Number three, impeachment. While Democratic leadership has been kind of lukewarm on the idea of impeaching President Trump, the base is not going to settle for anything less if the Democrats take the House of Representatives. They will demand that Trump be impeached for any reason whatsoever, and then they'll push the narrative that corrupt Republicans don't care about the rule of law. Now, it's just possible that Democrats could create a backlash that helps President Trump, that voters react to impeachment by supporting him, but that is a risky proposition at best. Number four, the economy. President Trump's chief selling point in his re-election effort will be the economy, obviously, and Democrats are dedicated to stifling economic growth if it means stopping President Trump. They will hold up budgets, they will blow out spending, they will push for harsh anti-business regulation. They'll kill the predictable pro-business climate President Trump has carefully crafted. The stock market will tumble as Wall Street begins to price in the effect of Democratic governance. And businesses will start to sock away capital again to prepare for the possibility of a unified democratic government that could enter Washington in 2020. Number five, foreign policy. President Trump's administration has done a terrific job of drawing us closer to our allies and throwing a scare into our enemies. He's done so because Republicans in Congress are willing to bolster our defense spending as necessary. The same is not true of Democrats, who would immediately move to cut defense spending, signaling to the world that President Obama's weak need foreign policy is back. Democrats would also attempt to undermine sanctions against the Iranian regime in keeping with Obama-era foreign policy. Sixth, get ready for polarizing culture wars. We've already seen the Democrats suggest that mob politics is the new normal. We've seen the Democrats capitalize on racial issues to polarize the country. We've seen them try to divide Americans by class and sex, too. With the platform of Congress, 
Look for Democrats to attempt a series of divisive maneuvers intended to relaunch those culture wars in new and frightening ways. Seventh, attacks on religious liberty. President Trump has been stalwart in his defense of religious liberty. Democrats will be just as stalwart in their attacks on religious liberty. They're surely going to attempt to push so-called anti-discrimination laws directed at religious businesses, churches, and schools. And then they will dare President Trump to veto those laws so they can claim that he and all Republicans are bigots. Eight, the twisting of social media. Now, Democrats have made a habit of threatening our biggest social media companies with investigations and regulations should they fail to crack down on conservative perspectives. Democrats, angry as all hell that Hillary Clinton lost in 2016, blamed companies like Facebook for so-called fake news and attributed Hillary's utter incompetence to the impact of Russian bots. Democrats don't actually believe any of that, but they've frightened social media companies into cracking down on free speech as a leaked report from Google to Breitbart News showed this week. Social media companies are deeply afraid of Democrats punishing them for failing to target conservatives. Don't be surprised if those social media companies escalate their efforts to do just that. Nine, radical growth of the Democrat media complex. Listen, we already know that the mainstream media institutions are dominated by Democratic supporters. And we know that those Democratic supporters will parrot pretty much any talking points the Democratic Party pushes out. But with Democrats in power pushing every line of attack simultaneously, the media's never-ending fire hose of anti-conservative propaganda will merely widen the nozzle. If you're worried about media bias now, wait until Democrats control Congress and put President Trump in their sights with the power of law. Tenth, mob rule. Democrats believe they have to lash out in anger in order to win in 2018. If they do win, they'll double down on that anger, hoping it carries them to victory in 2020. Did you like those mobs invading the Senate and the steps of the Supreme Court? Are you enjoying top Democratic officials nodding and smiling at crowds harassing Republicans in restaurants? Get ready for much, much more. The only way to shut down the Democrats' new mob rule strategy is to stop them cold at the ballot box. In 2016, Hillary Clinton lost the presidency because Democrats didn't show up to vote. They simply assumed she'd sweep to victory. They were wrong. Today, Republicans feel optimistic after the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh, which is understandable. I do too. But that optimism should not blind us to the importance of voting on November 6th. This Democratic Party is more radical than ever. They've embraced a nastier vision of politics than ever. But that does not mean they are fated to lose. Your vote matters. Your vote counts. Get out there on Election Day and ensure that the Democratic Party of Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Hillary Clinton aren't allowed anywhere near the levers of power. It's been an honor and a pleasure being with you on the Fox News airwaves over the last month. Thank you for your viewership. And remember, the fight for America's future is never over. I'm Ben Shapiro, and this has been the Ben Shapiro Election Special. Stay tuned for Steve Hilton, coming up next.